Well, good morning, and back in January, some of you might remember that I told you about a Christmas gift which I'd received, which was a lot of fun. Her name was Alexa. <laughs> some of you remember that? Here's why I'm bringing it to you this morning. After that, not once or twice, but three different times, three different occasions, while I was out in public, someone would stop and say, oh, I, I want to share with something with you, Pastor. I said, okay. One of these was at dinner one night. Bev and I were at dinner, and I could tell a couple at another table recognized us and kept looking our way. And during the meal, the woman came over and said, I don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to tell you a quick story. I said, well, of course. We're, you're not an interruption. We're glad to talk. And she said, well, a couple of Sundays ago, we weren't in church, but we were watching online. I hope that's okay. <laughs> I said, yes, it makes us happy when people watch online. And some do from all over the world each Sunday. And she says, well, you told about a new Christmas gift you'd received, and, and, and the name was Alexa, and you were illustrated, and you said you can ask just all kinds of questions like, Alexa, what's the temperature? And when you did that, ours answered your question. <laughs> so, Bishop, I suppose that we can begin counting all those Alexas watching online as well. <laughs> well, this morning I want to tell you about another gift which I received, which I also, well, I found it intriguing. It's a DNA kit from Ancestry.com. Some of you have done this? Well, it tells you your family origins, and, and all this comes from a little vial they send that you fill with saliva. Yes, spit. <laughs> now, let me just tell you, that is more difficult to achieve than you might think. It wouldn't have been hard at all when I was a teenager. You know, teenage boys. I just, that's how you know you're a teenage boy. You spit a lot. Anyway, I got my results back this last week. They're very interesting. And I also discovered that it doesn't just tell you that you're this percentage of this group and this percentage of that group, but if you just want to pay a little more money, you can find out actually where you have relatives in other parts of the world. So I could find out about possible relatives in such and such a village in France, for instance just a little more money. All this from a vial of spit. Now I began thinking to myself, if that saliva can tell my story and my history and it contains information key to my ancestry so that it will come to life, what else in nature tells a story? I thought of blood, of course. You go to the doctor, and you go for a physical exam, and they want to draw blood. And so bravely you let them, and you say, now it won't hurt much, will it? <laughs> no, no. And back from that, you get all kinds of information about your cholesterol, about how your kidneys are performing, about your thyroid. It's amazing, all that from some blood. You know, trees tell stories also. You've been to the National Park with the ranger where they have a slice section of a large tree and the ranger can show the rings and say, and this is how we, you know, one of the ways we know the age of the tree, the approximate age, and we can even tell if there have been severe periods of drought information from within the tree. You know, friends, I want to talk with you not just this morning, but during Lent about stones, ancient stones. 
Do you know that stones carry stories also? At least scriptural stones do. All through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we find stones used to mark an occasion, an event, to be a reminder. The stones of Scripture tell stories about our faith, our heritage, our spiritual ancestry, and they serve as markers in the unfolding story of God's salvation. This morning, we're going to jump into this and see one occasion when stones were used like this. We're going to, we're going to look at Joshua. You know the story. The Israelites are poised. They're ready to enter the promised land. Moses had brought them. He had led them out of captivity of Egypt. And you'll remember that there was that harrowing escape when they came to the Red Sea. And and the Pharaoh who had said, just get out of here, I'm tired of the plagues changed his mind and began pursuing them with his chariots and his soldiers. And so here came the Egyptians pursuing. Here were the Israelites stuck between the devil, the Pharaoh, and the deep Red Sea when God performed a miracle and he parted the waters so that they could escape. Now I mention that in order to mention the following. It was, yes, a miraculous escape, a miraculous exit. And then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years in that desert education experience because God said, I've got to get a lot of Egypt out of you before you're ready to enter the promised land. And so there was a new generation, and here they are. Moses did not make it. He's on Mount Nebo. He can see the other side of the Jordan, but there he dies. And God raised up a new leader for a new generation and for a new task, and his name was Joshua. And he's the one who led them in. Now, here's what so easily overlooked. Yes, the Israelites had a miraculous exit out of Egypt, the pardon of the waters, but do you know they also had a miraculous entrance into the promised land? Just as God had parted the waters of the Red Sea on the way out of Egypt, so God blocked the flow of the water of the Jordan River on their way into the promised land so they could cross on dry land. And the Bible, in Joshua, the third chapter, wants to make sure that we understand that the river was at flood stage. And it tells, describes where the water became blocked to stop the flow. Both miracles happened so that each generation, The one that came out of Egypt and the one about after 40 years still into the promised land would know that the Lord was with them in their time of need. It was, you might say, in short, like an exclamation point to the entire Exodus experience. As if God were saying, no, it's not by your might, nor your skill, nor your cunning, but by my power that you have been saved. And the same God performed both miracles. Now you will remember remember that Joshua told the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was not lost at this time. The Ark, which contained several important commemorative pieces of Israel's history, including the tablets, to enter the water, Joshua told the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to enter the water and that it would what? Stop flowing. And this event was so significant that after everyone had crossed the Jordan, Joshua, Joshua issued, issued further instructions. I quote verbatim. He said, choose 12 men from among, among the people, one from each tribe. And tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan 
to serve as a, what? A sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Rocks are not hard to find in the Holy Land. <laughs> May I just tell you that? You can't miss the rocks. They are everywhere from the Negev Desert, the Negev Desert in the south, all the way to the northern region of Israel and the, the, the fertile crop growing, fruit bearing, Galilee area, from top to bottom, rocks, rocks, lots of rocks. Huge stones, boulders, small rocks, pebbles in the streams. And stones are used by God to tell stories, to something permanent to remind people of God's power and God's might and God's sovereignty. We need that in our lives, don't we? We need some memory stones, don't we? Why? Because we humans are very good at forgetting. So here's a question. Is there anyone in this room who's not better at forgetting here in 2019 than you were, were in 2015. I've improved in forgetting. <laughs> it's something I just get better at every year, the ability to forget. So much so are we humans good at forgetting that we, we rely on tricks, memory tricks, little things to help us remember names or anniversaries or the chords, musical chords. Louise, when I was about first grade, my mother enrolled me in piano classes. She thought I needed, I guess, a little culture. There weren't so many offerings in those days, but our little town of Hamlin, Texas, little farming ranching town out from Abilene, about 30 or 40 miles, it did have a piano teacher. So I was a student, a piano student. That lasted about a semester until that good, kind-hearted and honest piano teacher had conversation with my mother and said, oh, he's such a fine young man, such a promising future, but it won't be in music. I think it all started the downward fall at the recital when I just froze in terror. So I was a short-lived piano student. However, I did walk away from those classes with one thing which has always remained with me. What? The chords. E, G, B, D, F. How do I know? Because she taught me every good boy does fine. It's a memory aid. It's the way you can remember planets as well. My very enthusiastic mother just served us noodles. <laughs> Mars, Venus, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. You see, you've got it. We're so good at forgetting, we need little devices, tricks to help us to remember. Do you know, I submit to you, that what's true of us individually is true of us collectively as a people, as a nation? We can so easily forget our heritage. One generation can forget. We can so easily forget the price that was paid for our freedom. We can presume that folks will always know. They don't. We can forget the long hours of hard work which our grandparents, our grandparents and our great-grandparents endured to lift their families out of tough times and began building economic security and a better life. And here we are today enjoying so much prosperity, such by and large, easy lives, affluent lives. 
we can forget somebody paid the price. Backbreaking, long hours, hard work. It's usually not good to forget. It's not good to forget an anniversary <laughs> or a birthday. It's sure better to remember names, isn't it? Thankfully, God knows us. God knows how prone we are to forget. He knows he created us. He knows how we're wired. He wired us. And therefore, God knows we need markers in life to remind us about who he is and to remind us about what is truly important. Markers that help us remember the Lord and his provision, the way that the Lord protects us, how God has always been faithful. Do you know what I think? I think we need some memory stones in our lives. When it comes to faith, not everyone can point to an exact place or time when he or she first became a believer. Not everyone can remember the place, the circumstances, the events surrounding it. For many of us, I suspect, coming to faith was a gradual process. And it's hard for us to pinpoint the moment. But for others, it's definitive. It's exact. It's, it's sudden, like the Apostle Paul. He could point to a time and a place where the road to Damascus. He was on the road to Damascus carrying orders. He was a Pharisee from the Sanhedrin. He had orders to go to Damascus to hunt down any believers in Jesus who might, we got to stamp it out before it spreads further. That was his purpose. That was his mission. That's the reason he was heading to Damascus. But on the way, what happened? There was a flash of light from heaven, like lightning, and he fell to the ground. And he was blinded from that flash. And he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, oh, he wasn't, no, the apostle Paul. <laughs> no, he was Saul, the persecutor. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? <laughs> I am Jesus. Oh, never doubt that that entirely changed his life and human history. It's the most radical transformation of a human being one can imagine. Not all of us have had that kind of experience. My father had that kind of experience, one which was seared into his memory. 1946, the war was just ending with Japan. He was in the United States Navy sailing into San Francisco Harbor but we had hundreds of thousands of soldiers and sailors and airmen, and they couldn't all be told to go home immediately. It took a period of time to decommission, and so there he was stationed on Telegraph Hill, San Francisco, and one weekend, he had plans, leave, lined up. One of his buddies' leave was canceled. Someone else invited him to go to church with him on that Sunday morning. Nothing else to do. Why not? So he went to Glide Memorial Methodist Church in San Francisco. And there a missionary was the guest preacher for the day. And at the end of the message, this missionary preacher had prayer and then said, I'm going to ask anyone who would like to accept Christ as your Savior, you want to give Jesus your heart and follow God, I'm going to ask you wherever you are in this room to stand. And I'm going to have a prayer for you. And that young sailor, my father, stood. And when he left that day, he never turned back. Never. Never. And he eventually led his own father from a hardened life 
as a railroad man to become an active Christian believer and a Gideon. <laughs> Not all of us have had sudden conversions. So many of us, we grew up, we might say, in the arms of faith. We feel like we've been Christians all of our lives. And so rather than being able to point to a time or a place, maybe the stone that we remember was a praying grandmother or believing parents or a Sunday school teacher who in the third grade or fourth grade took a real interest in us and and just nurtured us in the faith or perhaps it was an invitation to a youth event or maybe it was some heartwarming experience as Bishop Hayes had on the beach at Galveston when he was just a teenager when he gave his life to Jesus. Is that right? That's a stone for you. Thank God for that memory stone because we need them as we go through life because we have a way we have a way of straying at times, don't we? <laughs> now remember, we're talking about Israel and its interest into the, entrance into the promised land. And it was a mighty miracle of God, a moment to be remembered forever. But Joshua knew that even mighty miracles could be forgotten unless we do something to remember them. And so he instructed these 12 men, one from each of the tribes, to pick up a stone and carry it on his shoulder until they arrived at the place that they camped that night, a place called Gilgal. And there Joshua had them build a monument, a memorial from those 12 stones. And he had two things in mind. How do I know? Because the Bible tells us so. First, it was this monument was to be a teaching tool for future generations. Joshua knew that someday children would look at that and say, what's this about, mom? <laughs> hey, dad, what's the deal with the stones? An opportunity to tell the story again, how God provided, provided for them from the time he led them out of Egypt until he brought them safely into the promised land. It was God's doing. Never forget it, children. How long ago was that? 200 years, 400 years. The stones are there. Secondly, it was to be a testimony to a watching world. How do I know? Verse 24, chapter four. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth, did you hear that? All the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. A reminder of what God has done. Visual evidence that in the moment of crisis that God himself brought the people safely across the Jordan River. It was, a test, it was to testify about God's faithfulness so that all might know, oh, the God of the Israelites is a mighty God. He is a miracle-working God. There's no God like Jehovah. Now, there's a lesson here for us. We have a sacred responsibility to take the truth of God and see that it is passed down to our children and our children's children. That is our responsibility. In Psalm 102, the psalmist writes, let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. We make provision now for the future. And you know, in the next few weeks, you're going to see this hallway transformed. And you might, in your own class, Sunday school, or small group during the week, or cancer, or survivor support group, or whatever, find yourself displaced for a while. Why? Because we are providing for the future generation. That was the first domino that caused this entire project. Blame the children. This campaign, we should have called it Blame the Children. Those of us who are older, Scripture says, has a, have a special obligation to pass on the stories of what God has done. The psalmist, a different psalm, 
different psalmist. Psalm 71. Psalmist tries, even when I am old and gray. Can any of you raise your hand to that one? Do not forsake me, O God, until I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Oh, it's our responsibility. It's our privilege. The fact is, we need memory stones, reminders of who we are, of what we believe, or what our family stands for, for what our values are. We need memory stones because we tend to stray. We tend to stray. How many a young person has gone off to college or the military and lost his or her way and have begun to forget the past and the heritage and, and, and sometimes it's just for a short period, for a few years. Other times it stretches longer, much longer. And then there's that moment, perhaps you're back home and it's Christmas season and you go to Christmas Eve communion and something connects. Perhaps you're in church on an Easter or you're just back home where your grandmother lives and you go and you hear an old hymn, Rock of Ages and something clicks and you remember, you remember who you are. We, we need touch points in marriage. How many marriages have, have the bonds began to, to lessen the sentiment begins to fade, the, the commitment you lose sight of, and little by little the union begins to erode. How often has a wife or a husband at a, at a moment that was critical, how often has one, by God's grace, looked down and seen the wedding band and remembered the vows for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in hell. And you snap out of it and you say, yes, I remember who I am. The promise that I made. We need markers in life. So what does Joshua do? He has them set up a pile of stones. So in the future, when the children ask you, what do these stones mean? You can tell them. You know, we have a lot of uh, weddings at this church. And uh, so often at a wedding, the bride uh, requests a unity candle. Do you know unity candles? And if you go to the chapel where most of the weddings are, I could show you a place up on the chancel where the, the chancel carpet is, the rug, where there's a lot of wax that's accumulated over the years. Try as we might to keep it wax free. Sometimes, though, a bride wants a different kind of ceremony. And so from time to time, I suspect each of us pastors have had a different kind where there's a bowl and it contains little white stones and then there's another glass bowl. And in the ritual of the ceremony, you say to the couple, when God really comes through in your life, when you're aware of God's presence, write the date down. Take one of these stones and put it in the other glass container. And over the years, put it there. My goodness, if God had not intervened, we would have perished, I think. <laughs> we couldn't see any hope. Write the date, put it in. You know, if God had not shown up, we might have been toast. Write it down. We did not know how we get through this difficult time. Maybe it's with your children when they're teenagers, but by God's grace and prayers, write it down. Maybe you had one sick. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's one of your children. Write it down. There's a ritual. Put it on the shelf. Someday your children will see that and they go, what's this, mom? <laughs> what are all the rocks about, dad? You tell them. It gives you an opportunity 
you know God was good to us. Friends, we need to be marking these things. Write notes in your Bible. Some of your journal keepers, put it down. Tell someone, remember it. Times when God clearly has been at work in the life of your family or maybe times when you were in a low spot and discouraged and troubled about your children or work or your finances and you felt as though you could not get through it, but somehow you did. And God just overshadowed you with his peace, which transforms any human understanding. Mark that. Mark that occasion. Mom, Dad, what are these stones about? What do they mean? You can tell them your story. The story which gives witness to God's goodness. You can pass on the faith. Let me close with this. May we remember again what is so obvious, but we tend to forget. That the Christian movement is always one generation from extinction. And that every church is only one gener generation from closing. And if we do not pass along the fate to the rising generation, we have failed at our most important task. We must tell them what God has done in our lives. And then we must tell them again and again until the stories of Jesus and his mercy are tattooed on their souls. Tell your children how God is faithful, how he answers prayers in times of trouble, how he has rescued you from a life of sin to a place and a role of significance and value. Tell your children until it's tattooed on their souls so that someday, one day they might tell theirs. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.